Lord, you do, Michael. First, I want to thank uh, Annalise and Nadja for inviting me to do this. There are people who would be much better at doing this, who know much more about personal counseling psychology. She took a chance here. I don't know if you know how big a chance you took, but you did. So thank you so much for doing this, and thank you for organizing this, because it's a big, big, big Herculean effort. So thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Moscolo. I don't know what your background is in personal construct psychology. How many of you feel that you have almost no background in personal construct psychology? <laughs> okay. Okay. We've got our work cut out for us, but that's okay. That's what I was expecting. So let's, let's do that. Good. If, uh, if I go too fast, please slow me down. And if you have questions, feel free to simply ask them. Okay. Alrighty, a primer on personal construct psychology. This is somewhere in Montreal. Uh, it is a dance floor. And the music will come. Actually, yeah, there's no music. We'll cue the music. And we have a person. And she asks at this dance hall, who would I like to date? And then all these people kind of, we have this person here and uh, that person there. And, Somebody with the hat on backwards. And she's got a rather large choice of people there. Even grandma comes in. And we look at all these people and we can ask, what are some of the ways that we can construe these individuals? Okay? Some constructs. So immediately we'll I'm gonna tell you what constructs are, kind of by just getting right into it. So who would she like to date? So immediately when we see a group, a group of people, very first thing that comes to our heads quite often is age. Whether we want to believe it or not, or whether we're going to admit to some of these things or not. Age. We're going to say some people are older and some people are younger. There's a lot of young people here. And there's some old people here as well. And we see that immediately. <laughs> and so we have a construct. Young, old. Young, old. Okay? And the whole idea of a construct that's going to be very important is that it's bipolar. There's two poles to it. It's going to be a very important idea. There's a dichotomy, a dialectic going on here. So we can look at these people. We see some are young, some are old. Some are male, some are female. Another construct, male, female, male, female, which is arguably not the same as man, woman, or girl, boy, or a lot of other constructs that you could use. We could look at race. We see some are black, some are white. Or, maybe not, maybe this gentleman over here is brown, and we have black and brown, black, brown, white, or maybe person of color. And now the white person who just seems to be a little bit non-white becomes a person of color. So we have another construct for the same people, even in the same domain here. And we have some people who are cool, and maybe one guy over there is a dork that I don't want to, to date. Constructs, they're bipolar. There's two sides to them, very, very important. And she seems to be attracted to the woman in the middle. So, major part, very foundational of Kelly's theory, the idea of constructive alternativism. Constructive alternativism, stop me from going too fast or anything like that. Basically, all of our present interpretations of the universe are subject to revision or replacement. Whatever our interpretation is of the world right now, it could change. It does not necessarily map on to a, uh, a, universal, a universal interpretation, a universal reality. It is everything that we have and believe is open for revision. So here we have the male-female construct, which I, we are very clear that this construct has been open for revision. We've really, we've really changed this. We've really, uh, got, we have so many words and constructs to talk about gender. So if she comes in, she's di she dimensionalizes people along the male-female uh, construct, perhaps, or maybe trans-cis, which is a new cisgender versus transgender, which is a relatively new construct. Same people, different construct, arguably, which is very different from trans-normal. That's a different construct. 
If I say trans versus non-trans or trans versus cis, is different than trans versus normal because you're privileging one group over another and you've got a different construct, which is still different yet from trans afraid of. If I'm worried about other people accepting me, now I'm dimensionalizing the same group of people in yet a different construct. Our constructs, our interpretations of the world are open to revision. And they're open to revision along multiple bipolar constructs. It's the first basic, most basic idea that there is. You'll see very soon that that's very related to science. Ah, oh, there it is. First person is a scientist. Another metaphor that Kelly uses is this idea that people are like scientists. People are like scientists. Very different than the people that he was, uh, the people who were um, writing around the same time as, as he was, Freud, uh, Skinner, all these other people who would talk about people in very, very different ways. Kelly wanted to uh, make the analogy that people were like scientists. Scientists have theories. And with those theories, they generate hypotheses. Hypotheses generate experiments. Experiments generate outcomes that either validate or invalidate the hypothesis which leads arguably to a change in theory or not to a change in theory. That's what a site scientist is. And his analogy was that people, instead of theories, have construct systems, we'll talk about that, which are made of constructs and generate constructs in any given context. And I act on the basis of my concepts. Kelly said that behavior is like an experiment. All behavior is like an experiment that we use to test our theory. All behavior action is an experiment based on a construct, if you will, to test out our theory. And that our action, our behavior, either validates or invalidates our construct or our theory leading to construct revision. Very similar to the scientific. So, with those basic foundations, let's move to the core of the theory. This is it, right here. Here's the core of the theory. The theory is made up of a fundamental postulate, very scientific, and 11 corollaries. I mean, I've never seen such a thing. This is, I believe, a very beautiful theory. I love this theory. It's a beautiful theory. I don't agree with everything in it. In fact, I think there's some really big problems with it. But it's a beautiful theory. And one of the things that's so beautiful of it is it's so... It hangs together so well, and it, unlike so much of the rest of psychology, it addresses what a person is. You know, in so much of psychology and the social sciences, you start by studying the left earlobe, and then you study the left earlobe for maybe five years, and then you go to the right earlobe, and then you, <laughs> you move to the entire ear, and you go that slowly, and you never get to a person. Kelly starts with a whole person, and he's asked you, what are persons, how do persons act, how do persons function, and I think that's wonderful. Here's his fundamental postulate. A person's processes are psychologically channelized by the way in which he or she anticipates events. A person's processes are psychologically channelized by the ways in which he or she anticipates events. There's a lot of words there, and they're all important. The most important is anticipation. Anticipation. A person's processes are modulated, structured by, organized by how we anticipate what it is that we expect to happen in the future. So, here's a guy eating a candy bar. Okay, very simple everyday event. And he's saying, this is going to be good. Well, it's not good yet. He hasn't eaten it. Okay? He's living in the future. Okay? What does this tell us about where we live? We are eating the, the candy bar, and in every bite, we're anticipating something. We're after a certain type of experience. We're after a certain type of experience that we are constantly living in this future. We live in the gonna be. This is gonna be good. We live in the gonna be part. And that, and that future part, the way I like to say it, is that we live in a the future that structures the present. We live in the future that structures the present. 
Humans have a sense of futurity. Humans need hope. Humans need a future. We are always looking to create or to find a certain type of experience. And our processes are channelized by how it is that we anticipate the future. So the future structures the present. Where do we live? We don't live in the here and now, despite what the Buddhists would say, despite what the mindfulness people would say, I would argue. We don't necessarily live in the here and now. We live in a world of meanings that go beyond the information given. We, go, we live in a world of meaning that goes beyond the information given. We live in the not yet. That could be, but maybe it won't be. That's where we live. One of my idols is Kenneth Burke, the great Red Rooster. And uh, one of the things he said, which is very similar to what Kelly has to say, he says, we're not typically aware of just how much we take to be reality is made up of nothing more than our symbol systems. And he's right. We live beyond the information in a world that is not there, is the world we live in, not there. It's there between us in a created world. Burke talked about this idea of second nature. There was a big blackout in New York City, I think it was in the 1970s. And the whole city went black, no electricity. Well, what happened? That city went black. That city went back to nature. The first nature. The first nature is the world of, that's out there without our te technology, without Roland. Okay? The world without Roland is a very sad <laughs> world. Beautiful place. But, no, it's not. It's a, so that's first nature. You take out the lights, but everybody's incompetent. We can't do anything. We live in second nature. Everything that's here, that's the, from the chairs to the, if you just look at what's here, you just look what's here, you see a short guy. You don't see a professor. You don't see a speaker. You don't say, you see, don't see a delegate at the Congress of Personal Psychology or what have you. Those are all things that don't exist, but are brought into existence through our construing, through our constructs, through our symbol systems. So we live not in the here and now, but in the world of anticipations in a symbolic world. Very important fundamental posture. Remember when Kelly was writing, you had this guy around, okay? Skinner was yelling at people and saying that the stimulus was so important, that the Snickers bar is the stimulus, and the stimulus makes you do stuff. No, our anticipation structure our psychological processes, and this is explained in what Kelly called the experience cycle. This is the core of the whole theory. This is the core of the whole theory. People will say that the constructs are the core, the construct systems are the core. I would prefer to think that the experience cycle is the core because it's where everything comes from. Here's the experience cycle. I've already told you about it. You already know it. This is gonna be good. I have an anticipation. That's a construct. The Snickers bar, which is not a Mars bar, the Snickers bar versus the Mars bar is gonna be good rather than bad. Two constructs. And then I bite into it. I act. Hmm, that's not what I expected. That's not what I expected. This doesn't taste like a Snickers bar. It can't be a Snickers bar. This is the experience cycle. What is the experience cycle? We start off with anticipation. We're living in the future. We have a construct. This is going to be good rather than bad. This is going to be a good Snickers bar rather than a bad Mars bar. We invest in an action. We invest in the encounter, says Kelly. We bite the bar. And our anticipations are either confirmed or disconfirmed. Our anticipations are either confirmed or disconfirmed. Validated or invalidated in, in Kelly's thinking. And that may lead us to have to revise our construct or our prediction. In this case, the prediction or construct was this is going to be a good Snickers bar, and it's not. Our psychological processes, our actions, our feelings, what we're going to do once we bite into this bar, are psychologically channelized by the pattern of anticipations that we are making. Good. Questions? I'm going to go out of order from Kelly's, the way Kelly presents his theory. 
Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go, he has a, a fundamental postulate in 11 corollaries, and uh, I'm not going to use the corollaries in quite the way he uses it, because I think that there are other ways to do it. So, we got the fundamental postulate anticipation. Two, the construction corollary. A person anticipates events by construing their replications. The dichotomy corollary. A person's construction system is composed of a finite number of dichotomous constructs. Bipolar abstractions, concepts that have a dialectic to them, two-pole distinctions. The experience corollary, a person's construction system varies as he or she construes the replication of events. I want to talk about these three corollaries together, because again, they form the core of the theory. Construction, we anticipate by construing replications of events, we'll see. Construction corollary. A person anticipates events by construing their replications. Let's construe some replications. You ready? Keep construing. <laughs> so, what happened as you construed? Same. Hmm? Same. Same? We got one saying. Trying to make sense of what it is. Trying to make sense of what it is. And as you were trying to make sense of what it is, what happened? What happened? Were I, they just I couldn't. I, I had no reference point. Had no reference point yet, nothing to no constructs to so it's very primitive, whatever sense we're gonna make out of this. Yeah. A little face on one end. A little face on one end. So you're making meaning out of it by putting a face on one end. Mm. Good. Did you have the face from the beginning? Second one, I think. Second one, you think. Okay. So when we started here, you're looking at them. Every construing, very, this is a meaningless thing. And you're just beginning to make sense out of it. Oh, face. Okay. There's a face there. We're talking about very, we're looking at the same thing. And every time we see the same thing, we're actually beginning to see something different. Beginning to see something different. We construe. We a person anticipates events by construing their replications. Those are the replications that we're construing. So construing replications of events leads to differentiations in our experience. So there you have this blob. He kept looking at it, and then you began to be able to differentiate. You differentiated the face from the rest of it, and then this leads to constructs. A differentiation. A construct is a type of a differentiation. We'll see that in a few seconds. So, take a look. Let's do it again. Let's construe again. Here's the sky. Here's what he's seeing. And let's say this is his experience. Look, look at his experience over time. Okay? So, what, what's happening? He's looking at it again. Looks 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 at it again. And so, it's beginning to approximate every new replication of the event. Especially this this meaningless thing, we parse away and we make distinctions from. We distinguish this from that, this part from that part. And that leads to constructs. Here's a most basic construct. They're not there. The black thing from the white background. Okay? It's a construct. Black thing from the white background. And it's a pre-verbal construct. Babies will do this right away, right? But there's no words attached to it, which is a very interesting notion to talk about pre-verbal constructs. The thing that looks thisy versus the thing that's not thisy. The thing that I like, I know circles, but I don't know this thing. So this weird thing versus the other thing, constructs. I look over, replicate, I differentiate, and as I differentiate, I create bipolar abstractions. How are we doing? Now, this business of bipolarity is very important. It's very important. Very important. I hope, I hope I can explain to you how important. Before, constructs. Bipolar abstractions of experience. So you've, you've looked at that experience over and over again. You began to make these discriminations. You began to abstract this facey thing versus the not facey thing. Differentiations of discriminations of experience, constructs. Pre-verbal or verbal, they can be both. Here are some constructs. Take a look at these and see how important bipolarity is. Independent, what is the opposite pole of independent? Well, obviously it's dependence. Well, maybe not. 
Okay? The construct independent dependent is very different than the construct independent connected. If for me, my personal meaning is that to be independent, the opposite of that is to be dependent, and let's say dependency is bad in my construct system, that's very different than if the opposite of independent is connected. If the opposite of independent is connected, maybe I don't want to be independent. Maybe I want to be connected. Or maybe I can find yet another way to parse this that resolves the apparent contradiction between those two ideas. Independent weak. Um, there's a, a guy uh, I know who, I won't tell you his name, it rhymes with bump. And he, this is a very important uh, Trump. Yeah. This is the very important construct <laughs> in independent versus weak. America first, the, I'm independent, and the opposite of independence is weakness. Regardless of your politics, I would argue. Okay, so what have we got so far? Construction, dichotomy, experience, anticipation. It's a lot here. Construction corollary. A person anticipates events by construing their replication. With every construal, we make differentiations. That leads to dichotomous constructs. With each experience, our construct systems change. One more, one more, one more round of this. It's important. It's important. Construing replications of experience leads to dichotomous constructs. Right? What is it? Well, we don't know what it is. But it's a black thing against a white background. Right? Or is it? Okay? Well, wait a second. I looked at that black thing a whole bunch of times, and it looked like a thing. It was a thing. It was one thing. Well, now I see it's not one thing. It's one thing and behind another thing. But by looking at and construing its replication, sure, I thought I had it. My construct system was intact. Ah, something came along and invalidated my construct system. My construct system has now changed. What I thought was one thing is really something else. And I've made now another discrimination. Front, back. Front, back. Okay. The core of the theory is this idea of anticipation and the experience cycle. I've got a construct, I lay it up against the world. The world comes and, and either slaps it around or validates it. If it slaps it around, I change like a good scientist my constructs. And when I do so, I begin to build something called a construct system. A system of constructs. What does that look like? Kelly says, an organizational corollary. Each person characteristically evolved for his or her convenience in anticipating events. A construction system embracing ordinal relations between constructs. So I don't just have one construct, I have a whole bunch of constructs. They have relations to each other, and those relations are hierarchical and ordinal in, in nature. What could this mean? Okay, so look, remember our, our friend in the beginning who wanted to go on a date, okay? She goes into the dance floor, and she sees her immediate, her immediate construct. Let's see. Who am I interested in? In the world of my relationships, there's my first construct. Here's my relationships, and here's people I'm not interested in. Here's my first distinction. And now within my, and here's another construct. Within my relationships, hmm, what am I doing right now? Am I on a date? Or am I, are we just friends having a drink? That's a very different construct then. Are we on a date uh, or are we on a hookup? Very different construct. The, by the, the alternative pole of the construct tells you what the meaning is of the construct. You can never know something by itself. Always has to be known in relation to other concepts. Derrida, you know, this is you know, Derrida made a career of this idea. Construct system. So now I'm on my date. Hmm. Here's another distinction. Do I like the other person, or am I not feeling it? <laughs> And if I like, whoops, if I'm not feeling it, what do I do? Do I muddle through? Or do I escape? <laughs> <laughs> and 
And if I'm liking her, here's another distinction. Is she like me? Is he like me? Or is the other person not very responsive? And if they like me, well, should I flirt or should I play hard to get? Or if they're not very impressed, is it responsive? Do I, should I try to impress them or should I give up? <laughs> this is a construct system. A series of constructs in an ordinal relation to each other. Now imagine what a person is in Kelly's framework is, if you will, a series of a construct system. A person is, in, if you will, the functioning of his or her construct system in a context. I bring this system to my context and here I am. That's me. And I would be different if I had different constructs and especially if I had different polarities there. We'll see that in a few minutes. Construct system. Choice corollary. Important. A person chooses that alternative in a dichotomized construct through which he anticipates the greater possibility for the extension and definition of his or her system. Go back to the old scientist guy. He's got a theory. He wants to extend and define that theory. He wants to make it good and predict it. He wants to be able to predict stuff. Choice corollary. Here's how it works. There's our construct system. Okay? Now what does it mean to make a choice? Kelly's got a very interesting notion of choice. It's not the silly notion of a, of a free will, okay? That says we just choose willy-nilly and we can do whatever we want. We don't have bodies or constraints. And it's not a deterministic notion where choice is, is, is illusory. Choice is always constrained. Choice is always, is not quite free. It's not quite determined either. What have you got? Here's our person on the date. All right, so here's my relationships. Where are we? Are we having a date or are we having relationships? Now given, if that's my construct, imagine that's my construct, and you and I, if it's the only construct I have, and you and I start to interact, all right, am I on a date or are we have friend? Let's say I want to have a date. You start to be unresponsive to me. Well, maybe I begin to change my view right then and there from we are on a date to we're having friends. We're just friends having a drink and I've just now saved my self-esteem. Here, I'm here. I like her or I'm not feeling it. Construct. I make a choice. She's not being very responsive. I make a choice. What do I do? Do I give up or do I try to impress? Each one of these, I choose the alternative in a dichotomized construct through which I anticipate the elaboration of my system. That's how choice works. It's constrained by the construct system. Choice code. Yes. Well, it's also responsive. It's reactive. So it's not. It's not uniquely anticipatory. Would you kindly hold that wonderful comment? Okay. It's a wonderful comment. I would also note that the term reactive and responsive may be very different terms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Reactive for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Is I would argue might be you might see that as a mechanistic concept. Responsive means that. I am spontaneously always seeking to be responsive to what you say and do and feel, which is a much more Kellyan term, and he's gonna, it's, that's going to come up. Uh, so anticipate, that it, and that's going to be a problem for the theory, I'm going to say. So hold on to that, and people will disagree. Yes, sir? Are these kind of systems of choice, how would it correlate to gaming, for instance, and how would that affect the psychology? What is, it, is it a little bit more... Um, I guess the choices that people make within like a game and how the other avatar reacts. Does it are people more loose, I guess, than with the choice or is it more flexible system? You know, that's that question is very similar to, to Michael's question. Yeah. Because you're asking about constraints on choice that exist outside of the context of my yeah. of my personal construct okay. system. And so what Kelly's going to say very soon is that is that, and he's only talking about people here, he doesn't talk, this was 1955, we gotta update this theory. It doesn't have video, video games in it. That there are constraints outside of the, of the system, rules that we interact with, social rules, uh, the scaffolding and the structure of the game itself plays a role, a direct role 
in my anticipations. They're actually part of my anticipations. So you gotta bring that into it as part of the construing process. In my opinion, I don't think that Kelly did that in 1955. Uh, but, um, so that provides constraints from the outside. Here's the constraints from the inside. I put them here and I have these choices. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Great question. Just an additional point here, Michael. Um, one of the, the issues that I've been dealing with in the last little while is this whole idea that games as we've known them are starting to change. Um, I've got a couple of proposals, PhD proposals sitting on my desk that talks about the inclusion of adaptive um, uh, gaming, essentially, by the inclusion of uh, artificial intelligence inside the games, which changes the system totally. Or even the very notion of a video game being a storytelling device or a form of, of a movie or, or some sense. They, you know, these new technologies create new ways of being in the world. Yep. And so the, the culture is helping to create me, right? The technology helps to create me. And that, that's a very important piece that we have to consider. Thank you. Okay, so that's where we are so far. Uh, constructive alternativism and choice. Let's take it the next step. So, I'm on a date, the person's not very responsive to me. What do I do? Do I impress or do I give up? Well, I can invent another polarity. Well, maybe I can say, she's not very interested in me, but she can't choose who she's attracted to. It's not my fault. All right, I've now come up with a new book, Polarity. I've now, and that polarity, again, is constrained by my construct system. This new construct came out of this construct, came out of a contrast here between here, or maybe here. That new contrast, I can create a new construct system, and now I'm beginning to free myself from my own construct system, which is constraining my construing. <laughs> Here we go. She doesn't like me. She, she does like me. I'm going to flirt. Well, I, I, I don't flirt very well. Hard to get. Well, that kind of sounds a little old-fashioned. I'm not going to do that. I, we'll explore our feelings instead. All right? Third, a third alternative. If I'm not feeling it, if I muddle through or escape, well, maybe we'll engage with compassion and I'll say, you know, I'm not really feeling it. Are you feeling it? Oh, let's talk about our feelings and, and we'll be new age people or some such thing. So, choice is constrained by the construct system with experience, we elaborate that construct system. Let's go further. Individuality correlate. People differ from each other in their constructions of events. There's one person, there's another. All right, this person is a traditional male. He believes that there are males who were boys who become men, and when you're a man, you're a gentleman, and if you're not a gentleman, the opposite of a gentleman is a womanizer or a bore. Okay, females, you got girls and women. Women should be ladies or they're unrefined. They should be virtuous or they're sluts. Okay, traditional male. It's one way of seeing the world. Here's another way, very different, okay? Now, this is interesting. In a binary, I'm gonna reject a binary, okay? So we've got a binary here, Gender, well, I'm going to reject the binary. Binary is on one poem. So here, here's the binary. No, instead of the binary, I'll, I'll embrace gender fluidity. Mm -hmm. And as a gender fluidity, I might be able to choose within this system of who I want to be uh, at, at uh, if I'm gender fluid, who I want to be and uh, present myself as in any given situation or how, how it feels. And a woman, sexuality, might, the distinction might be between sexual power and slut shaming rather than virtuous versus slut. Two very different construct systems. Individuality corollary. Ray, uh, I gotta go to this one first. <laughs> Commonality corollary. There's the traditional male, there's the gender fluid person. Not a lot of commonality. Commonality corollary, to the extent that people employ constructions of experience that are similar, 
to that employed by the other, his processes are similar to those other persons. This person's processes are not similar to this person's processes. There is little commonality. Is there any commonality? Both got bodies. Excuse me? Both got bodies. Both got bodies, but it's not in this, it's not in the, it's a, that might be a pre-verbal construct that is implicit here. Males and females is in both. Yeah. yeah. Males and females. Yeah. Male and female. Here you go. Not a heck of a lot more than that. But guess what? There's commonality. Not a lot. But that commonality can become the basis of sociality. And if this person wants to influence this person, this person better start with the commonality and then work outward from that. And that's going to start as well as sociality. Sociality corollary. Commonality corollary, if I got similar constructs, I got similar systems. I, I function similarly. Sociality, to the extent that one person construes the construction processes of another person, I can play a role in the social process with that person. This is a very important corollary. To the extent that I construe your construings, I can play a role in a social process with you. Mm. So, traditional male, traditional female. We start off with her binary, or his binary. This person construes this person's system. Males and females. To the extent that I construe the construction system of the other person, now I can play a role in the social process. I can have a social role with that person. If I don't construe the other person's construings, I can't. When this person begins to apply this to this, to construe the other person's, it's not gonna be a fit when we start off, this person's not gonna quite get it. And then we're gonna to have to have some discourse. Now we have a social role going on here and we have the, the foundation to transform each other's thinking through sociality. Yes? Will the sociality corollary be something analogous to empathy? I know how you feel. Yes. It is perhaps best uh, uh, um, understood in terms of the, the metaphor, the everyday metaphor of perspective taking. Standing in the other person's shoes. I'm going to get, I'm going to um, put myself into your shoes so that I can see how you're experiencing the world. Very powerful notion. Very powerful notion. Very important notion. Also problematic, mm -hmm. which I want to show in a few minutes. <laughs> What's our time? Uh, another 15, and then questions? Another 15? So it's 11, 11, 15 now at this point. How much time do I have to talk? Another 15 minutes. Oh, that's great. Sorry. You got me for another 15 minutes. <laughs> um, okay, let me show you some other some other corollaries here. If I'm if I'm if, I, if if you're saturated, tell me, and I will go to something else. Um, but if not, you got to tell me. I'm not. My feelings aren't going to be hurt. Let's go back here. Here's another corollary: the range corollary, very important. A construct is convenient for the anticipation of a finite range of events only. If I have a construct, it doesn't apply to everything. It has a limited range of convenience. Here, what is a bachelor? There's a bachelor. A bachelor is an unmarried male. You got a construct male, female. You got the construct married, unmarried. Male, married is an unmarried male. That's a bachelor. Except. What do we have? What about that? <laughs> is the Pope a bachelor? <laughs> Not by his construct, anyway. The, the construct bachelor single doesn't apply to the Pope. It's outside of its range of convenience. The Pope is an element, you will come to hear, to which the construct can be applied. But it, this construct does not apply to to the Pope, even though it might seem to be. Boy, we get surprised. Constructive alternativism. Fragmentation corollary. I 
I worry about overwhelming you because God, the theory is big. And if I'm beginning to overwhelm you, please tell me. Fragmentation corollary. A person may successfully employ a variety of construction substances which are inferentially incompatible with each other. Logic is not a feature, a strong feature of human psyche. When we think of logic or the, or the like, that's not what, what we're about. We don't operate on the basis of those, of that. we operate on the basis of what Piaget would call a logic of meaning, of meaning and even affect. So, here's a, a piece that I wrote about, Confessions of a White Ex-White Supremacist. This is a story that I found online. It's about a guy who was raised as a white supremacist. And he believed that blacks were inferior, less intelligent, disgusting. He would wrestle them and feel disgust to go and take a shower. He would try to hurt them by, uh, while he was wrestling. This was his construct system. Blacks are inferior to whites, unintelligent, unattractive. Then he goes to college. And he meets Ozzy, a black woman, who he says, oh, you must have gotten here through affirmative action. You must be on sports. You must be dumb. And then he finds she's got a nice smile. Wait a minute. This doesn't fit with this. Okay? And then he pushes that away. Pushes that away. Nah. The, you know. And then she starts to work with him on a project. And she's leading the project. And she's smart. And she's doing it much better than he is. Now we've got these two systems that are in, they're fragmented. They're kind of in contradiction to each other. And little by little by little, he begins to see that this is, a, this is a conflict. And he can't deal with the conflict. The mere fact of the fragmentation here, that he can hold these two, these two subsystems, that are logically incompatible, we do it all the time. This is a particularly uh, a, 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 a significant example of it. And then when these two systems can come into conflict, now we have the, the real capacity for change. But the change in this guy took place over a long period of time. After resisting, after pushing away, after saying she's an exception, and then he ends up marrying her <laughs> at the end. Now, I don't know if the story's true or not, but <laughs> it was online and something called the Experience Project. Um, but it's a compelling example. I'm going to skip over the modulation corollary. We did commonality and sociality. One of the things I love about this theory is its view of emotion. It's both the strength and the weakness of the theory. If I ask you what emotion is, you'll tell me it's a feeling in your tummy. The feeling I have. And the feeling is somehow different than my thought. Feelings are different from thoughts. And feelings and thoughts and actions are different. For Kelly, an emotion is not some little ginger pop thing that you get kicked off in your tummy from a stimulus. For Kelly, an emotion is the state of the entire person as a system in the process of change, of actual or impending change. So that anxiety is the awareness that a situation falls outside of the range of my construct system. Guilt is the awareness of dislogicment of myself from the role I wish to be. Hostility is the attempt to extort confirmation for a failed ex, uh, ex, uh, anticipation. In other words, my, my processes, including my emotions, are psychologically channelized by the way in which I anticipate events. Different emotions correspond to different relationships between the world and my anticipations. And it's the state of my body and my entire system that arises as a result of those relationships. Modern emotion theory would refer to this in terms of appraisal theory. Okay, enough of that. Here's the theory in a nutshell. You got the fundamental postulate. The core process is the construction corollary, the dichotomy corollary, the experience corollary, and the choice corollary. I, my processes are channelized by the ways in which I anticipate events. 
As I construe their replications, I make dichotomous constructs, and then I choose my actions within that system of constructs or in the, Michael, what is your name? The person in the back with the, who's, what is your name? Yes, Tristan. Tristan, in the Michael Tristan uh, uh, extension of it, uh, we choose our, our, our constructs uh, uh, constrained by our construct system and by the social context that also can creates constraints upon that. That's the core process, the experience cycle. From that you get a structural part of the theory which talks about how these constructs get organized. The idea that we have, we organize our constructs, they can become fragmented, they only have a certain range of convenience, and then this explains personality processes and how we relate to others. The individuality corollary, different persons and personalities correspond to different construct systems. The commonality corollary, I've got a, if we, if we have similar construct systems, our psychological processes are similar. The sociality corollary explains how we get together. That's the theory in a nutshell. Now before I bid you adieu, I want to critique it there. Here's some critical comments. And these will be controversial. These will be controversial. Uh, some people at the conference who are sitting here right now, they would argue with me. First, these are my criticisms. The theory has a strongly individualistic bias. Yes, it has this notion of sociality, but it's the individualist primary. It's called personal construct theory. It's not called relational construct theory. Mm -hmm. okay, it's called personal construct theory. So you get this bouncy ball back and forth thing. When we're con when we're, this is what I was talking about when I said there's a problem with sociality and a problem with perspective taking. Okay, The problem with the concept of perspective taking itself. Because what it presumes, the concept of perspective taking, at least as Kelly says it, in order for me to be social with you, I have to take your perspective. What that implies is that first, we're cut off from each other. And only when I construe your construings can we play a social role. Creates a very big problem. If we're cut off from each other, how in God's name do I ever construe your construings? Don't I have to have some sense of what you your constraints are to begin with in order for me to construe that? If I don't have any sense of your construction process, you're a robot. <laughs> I don't know that you have any anything. You're just a bunch of contortions. And that's not how we experience the world. I think that's a problem. This leads to this kind of bouncy ball back and forthness of construing, which is not how I think we construe. This is how I think we construe each other. We are connected right from the start. Right? If there's a date going on here, this person glances at this person, this person looks at this person, and they're talking with each other. There's something called the mirror resonance system, which I'll be talking about in my talk, whenever that is, probably tomorrow, that hooks us up right from the beginning of life. Right from the beginning of life, we have commonality and intersubjectivity with from each other and our capacity for perspective taking builds on that we don't start off as individual and become social we're social right from the beginning we're individual right from the beginning and through that dialogical process sociality and commonality develop in my opinion that's a big problem with the theory second problem Construct or the construct system is the primary unit of the theory. I think that's a problem. What about goals, desires, feelings? Are these mere constructs? Construing, desiring, wanting, feeling, believing are forms of doing. They're aspects of doing which are actions. For Kelly, construct system is primary. For me, action is primary. Action. Constructs are forms of doings, where action means goal-directed thinking, feeling, uh, uh, um, motor action, all at once. Our, we interpret in and through our actions, in our bodies, 
uh, uh, to, to focus only on construing makes it seem like a disembodied um, and I know cognitive process, even though the, the Kellyans would would, um, would refute it. Um, last thing I would say that Kelly lacks is an emphasis on about the evaluative moral dimension of life, the good. You look through Kelly's theory, you're going to strain very hard to find any notion of good. He is really, think of it, a scientist is supposed to be non-evaluative, right? Scientist just looks at what it is, right? Not what it should be. And Kelly was a great libertarian. Everybody gets to have his or her own construct system. No, so his value system was that everybody gets to have his own, this kind of relativism in a sense, I would argue. That's a problem. That's a problem. I, you know, I would argue just, you know, think of the scientists. Think of the scientists. Uh, Harry was saying this to me yesterday. So the scientist has a theory and then goes and does an experiment and the experiment doesn't agree with the theory and what does the scientist do? Huh? I can't think of it. Construct another experiment. Uh, even before he constructs another experiment or changes the theory. Oh, you doubts the results. You doubt the results! <laughs> right! <laughs> right? Come on! This didn't come out the way I wanted it to come out. This isn't good. I'm not going to be a bad scientist. And so, you know, I begrudgingly go back and I'll try to turn it around and then maybe I'll change my theory. Well, uh, maybe I'll change my theory, but the point is that's not how we operate. That's not, we are emotional beings. You know, first and foremost, we are evaluating beings. We are looking after our experience as good or bad. We're not, we don't just change our theory. So there's got to be something more to it. There's got to be, in my view, uh, um, uh, 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 a more direct role of value, emotion, uh, sociality, uh, uh, the good, and the moral. I think that's lacking. In the theory. So, I think that's everything I want to say. Uh, let's talk. Uh, let's take, take some time to talk. And, uh, There's the typical, um, you know, you're supposed to ask questions. It'd be better if we just talked, if we could. And I'm, I will sit and see what, so what time is it now? Uh, 1130. 1130? Yep. Bang on time. No, I'm not on time. But take 15. It's okay. No, I'm not on time.